Welcome to Lean Agile Management Podcast that helps you boost work efficiency, create culture of high performance, and build teams that thrive. Welcome to the lounge. Today in the show. Before you find a solution, you need to understand the problem. They are, they are, they are to kill you, and they will effectively kill you if you don't do anything. You know, it's just interesting that actually when we do agile transformations, we forget about using agile. We don't know how we're going to do it until we actually do it. Be aware and accept the fact that we don't know everything. In reality, the customer doesn't know what they want. What we should be doing really is expecting change. Our special guest today is Jose Casal. He is a business agility coach with experience working in both private and public sectors. Jose is a public speaker, chairman at the Agile Method Specialist Group at BCS, Chartered Institute for IT, and is the founder of Actineo Consulting. Hi, Jose. Welcome on the show. Hi, Dimitro. Thank you for having me here. It's, it's a pleasure. pleasure. So recently, you've made a presentation that made some waves on online, let's say. It's been trending on some Twitter communities and all around. And the content was quite provoking. One of the most uh, memorable lines was, agility is not an option. It's a matter of business survival. Mm -hmm. So could you, could you elaborate a little bit on this and explain why is agility is not an option? What inspired this title? Um, in part, it's, um, in reality, I mean, agility is not an option. Um, I think companies can choose whether to um, to use agility. And when I talk about agility, I'm talking about all of the business agility as well. Um, it's an option for them to use it. Um, what that doesn't mean is that we can guarantee their survival in the long term. Um, uh, why I'm saying this is because um, you get an element of... Um, Sometimes of resistance that people say, you know, anything with agile is not for me. It doesn't work in my business. It's not for my context. And it can be true. But typically in many organizations, if we are not fully aware of the level of complexity of our work, we tend to oversimplify how complex our work is. Mm -hmm. We are not aware of the interdependencies, how, how complex is, uh, how interdependent, how uncertain the work that we do is. If we don't build a culture of learning, if we don't build a culture, culture of um, discoverability. Um, my take is that companies will not be able to survive. There will be new incumbents that will take over, will take their place, they will replace them. Um, so um, that's, that's what I'm saying, in, in essentially, that it's not an option. But if we don't bring in agility into our business environments, my, my opinion is that um, we will just not survive. Mm, that's a very strong point. And could we clarify a little bit what business agility really means? Um, Okay, so I, I think that the term business agility per se, it's, um, I would argue that it's something that is emerging right now. So I don't think there is a formal definition of what a business agility is. Um, to me, um, when, I, when I think about business agility, I do think about organizations who are, I don't know, I don't know if the word structured is the right word, but the organization is capable of responding to the changes that their own internal people and external customers and the market throws at them. Mm. So being, being able to understand what their context is, internal and external, adapting to that context or influencing that context, you know, always responsive. It's also sometimes, you know, if we can be more proactive about it as well, right. even better. Um, so um, I, I, I've got a, a personal kind of like when I talk about um, business agility, um, and I think about the sort of like of, um, guiding principles that I will have for that. Um, a lot of it is about kind of like flipping the way we do, changing the way we do, um, almost you know 180 degrees. Um, <laughs> so um, I talk about the um, things like um, focusing on creating a positive impact. Um, that could be economic value, that could be a reputation, that could be um, you know um, know how, whatever it is. But something that we're doing things. When we do some things, we need to achieve a positive impact, um, as opposed to just focusing on things like, you know, cost reductions and saving money. So there is an element of like the economic element, but, but focus on the value, on the impact we generate, not on the cost. Um, the other thing that I, I, I would talk about a lot is about um, sort of like time, but time in the sense of like how well, how quickly and how well we are organized so 
most of the organizations are just queue management organizations. Yeah, and you, uh, it takes ages for a lot of the work, especially when you look at end-to-end business flows. They're very, very slow, very inefficient. Things mm-hmm. take ages, and, and there is lots of like handovers and queues and approvals yeah. and so on. So improving the flow of the organization, making sure things um, go as quickly as possible from the idea to the market time, that would, that would be the idea. And that, that actually creates better impact as a result. Hopefully we, we do the right things. Um, the last, another one would be, um, again, you know, we tend to still many times to uh, just focus on, on throwing things out there. Lots of things, lots of things, lots of things. I, I would rather deliver less, but deliver le- le- fewer things. Um, but those things being much better for for the customers and the organization. So rather than the sort of like quantitative, let's do lots of features, I will look at the qualitative, you know, are we doing things which are fit for purpose? Um, so um, it's, it's a quality aspect, yeah. So it's, it's deliver, deliver um, things that create an impact as quickly as possible with flow thinking of uh, flow management and, uh, and uh, achieving fit for purpose in what we do. Um, those three things on its, on their own are, not enough. Um, we are working in most of the times in, in, in knowledge organizations. Um, so they, they will be have human systems and um, therefore in those environments, people are fundamental. So what are we doing about creating the right environments? The, the cultural aspects, the collaboration, the safety, the innovation, all this discoverability, all these things. Um, and the last one then is, you know, if we are in knowledge work, how are we learning? So what do we do in order to create continuous learning? And when we learn something, how do we disseminate that new knowledge? Um, so for me, business agility, in, uh, when you when we have a company that is exhibiting business agility, it will have this um, um, flow, fit for purpose, impact, learning, and, and focus on people, which funnily enough goes into flip. <laughs> 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 so the key to business agility is flip well just flipping the way we do things yeah um you know um bring you know stop trying to pretend that we we, we are certain in certain mm-hmm. environments when we are in uncertain environments and that requires changing flipping the way we do things so right. you know the experimentation the discovery all this thing across the entire business um mm-hmm. and, and that's a fundamental change um that we need to do slowly in small steps yeah right incrementally mm-hmm. But I see that you're making connections between mm. agility and business success. Mm-hmm. So it's about business agility as one thing. Yeah. And are there some more specific roadblocks on the way to business agility? I think there would be a, a number of um, roadblocks, challenges, uh, misconceptions over there. Um, um, some simple ones is that um, we'll go through, for example, like things like we see um, agile and agile frameworks and agile methods. Mm-hmm. Uh, something that it's for IT, it's for the techie people that are just there doing whatever. Yeah, um, and, and many times the the business doesn't doesn't even uh, consider that this is relevant to them. It's, it's 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 usually very difficult, or we find it difficult to get people in non IT areas to consider agility. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, uh, and, and that's it for a subject there is, a, there is a thing there is a, an interesting point there because um, this um, IT and the business uh, divide is shouldn't exist it should basically be a thing of a past it should, or should have never existed most of the businesses today are IT businesses um, so this, this distinction that we have many times um, is just not beneficial to us um, it actually is quite quite counterproductive, I think. Um, other things that I see is um, a lack of understanding of how much discoverability we have in our environments, how much we need to experiment. So, uh, as an example, like you, you get situations in which organizations, the, the, we try to give an element of certainty, even when we right. work in uncertain environments. So you will hear a leader, you know, managers, leaders, whatever, um, saying like, I know exactly what I'm going to do. You know, follow me, I have a plan. And then we inflexibly follow those plans without realizing that, yeah, well, you know, it's great to have a plan. It's great to do mm-hmm. planning, but you have to respond to the, to the discoverability of it. Um, and especially when companies have like, trying to have long-term strategies, which many times they don't, they're not the strategies and probably they actually don't, not, don't materialize in the way they have been communicated. So I think many times we, we have this 
we use the language of certainty when what we should be using is the language of discoverability or testability, probing, experimentation, and so on. Um, so we have a cultural um, sort of like gap there in, in, mm. in business in understanding how we should be running businesses today. Um, which, which leads to another interesting point, I think, many times, is that if... I am a senior leader in a company. I'm a CEO, for example, of the business. Right. And I feel that I have to provide certainty and I have to provide leadership in the way. Leadership as in, I know exactly what we're going to do. That is detrimental to, for example, have a learning environment where many times, you know, managers, uh, I've seen managers who do not read, who do not, who do not read new materials, who do not accept that they learn because it's seen as almost as a, as a, as a being weak or vulnerable or something like that when it should be the other thing. I mean, it should be exactly the opposite. You know, we should be staying curious. We should be learning. We should be trying new things. As, as managers, we should be the engine of helping be the engine of a learning culture, of an experimentation culture mm-hmm. and create those kind of like really rich environments that we, we know are needed in, in complex you know, interdependent and certain environments. Right. Mm-hmm. Yes, it's. I don't know whether there's a big long answer, but you know, there are three three aspects there. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, but and it sounds like a very familiar issue because yeah. um, there's a lot of chatter even online about how people are not sure what exactly experiment means. Because yeah, mm-hmm. we say okay, in agile environment, you should be experimenting, mm-hmm. but how exactly does it look like without, especially when people are, they feel like this is threatening their authority. Because then you, it's exactly what you said. It's admitting that, oh, maybe I don't know what we're doing. And mm-hmm. then people will start asking questions if that's the right position. And h- how do you see this kind of fears being, how can people overcome this? How can they productively talk about this? There are a number of things, obviously, we have to know. One is the first thing we have to do is obviously um, all of us uh, is um, be aware and accept the fact that we don't know everything. Um, mm-hmm. And that we, and actually, more important, probably we know that whether we accept it or not, not the same. But also, be comfortable with the fact that we don't know and we can talk about it. So create an element of vulnerability and 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 allowing us to to make mistakes. Right. In doing so, to create that sort of thing, I think that we need to to be able to generate a space of safety. Uh, so create, you know, uh, Google has been talking for for a number of years now about psychological safety and, and things like equal voice, creating environments where we can make mistakes, we can try things, make mistakes, make sure that those mistakes are not fatal to the organization. Mm. Um, but um, but make sure that we're learning from those mistakes and we make things better. Now. That, that, those are things that we cannot just change overnight. We cannot just install a new, a new entirely mindset or a new way of responding to things. But just being aware of it and start trying to do little by little the kind of exhibit the kind of behaviors that we need to do. That's what changes a company DNA. That's what, that, what changes the culture of the organization. But we've got to go step by step, uh, which is interesting as well because many times in our organizations, what we lack is patience. Hmm. We try to achieve things too quickly, too fast and too quickly, and too much of it, too much, too much change. Um, uh, and, and instead, what we should be is very patient. We should be patient and relentless. Keep going, keep going, keep going. But small steps every time. Make sure that they're safe. Make sure that um, whatever, the, whatever we're trying to do is, is, is just one extra step, a bit more. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Oh, that's that's so so strong. Mm-hmm. People um, talk about this as well. People like to put it in words as thinking about it as a big project, having mm-hmm. big project mentality. Mm-hmm. But this is such a more vivid <laughs> explanation of this, yeah. because yeah, it's it's a huge thing. Yes, it is. But then it's not supposed to be one time thing that you just throw at your people and then expect everything needed. Yeah. So it, it's it's an interesting. Um, I don't know if the word paradox is correct here, but um, it's an interesting situation that. In, in software development, for example, we've mm-hmm. known for a couple of decades now that big projects don't work when we have lots of change going on and lots of variability and, and you know, volatility. So what, we, what did we do? We said, look, we're breaking them, break them down, make them smaller, release frequently, have a feedback loop, learn from it, and discover right. what you didn't know. So we, we know what we need to do. Then... When we go to about changing the way we have organization, when we go about improvement, you know, all those things, um, 
we forget all these things that we learned and we go like, oh, let's do a big transformation. <laughs> well, we shouldn't do a big transformation. What we should do is just continuous change. You know, the same approach. Break it down, make it small, make it safe. Have feedback loops, learn what you didn't learn. Give it time. Um, but, you know, it's just interesting that actually when we do agile transformations, we forget about using agile. I, I, maybe it's, also it's just part of a, it's proof of a pudding, yeah? Uh, it's, mm. it's that, that we know these things and we, we are helping organizations do that. But we also know that, you know, for each one of us, I mean, most of uh, all of us that have, are working in agile environments today, um, I, I could probably say that, you know, the, the majority or, or the vast majority of us did not start, start our professional careers in agile. And definitely we did not have an education, which was, mm. um, uh, preparing us for the, for the current work, work environment. Um, so, um, we are probably, well, I think not probably, I think we're quite, 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 um, in reality fighting, um, our own internal mindsets, which are, have been built against, you know, the, what we know about agile. So we, you, we are all of us, I think, rewiring our own brains and, you know, helping us do things in a better way, re fundamentally changing the way we, we react. Um, and under pressure, I think, you know, that's where people go go back to the most deepest way of doing things. Um, I don't, it, might be, it might sound unfair, but, you know, I see that quite a few times, including myself, that under pressure, we kind of like, we forget things and we go back to the not so good ways of doing it. Right. Revert to the old ways. <laughs> yeah. um, in your presentation, you also had that spoke about myths and the reality of product development. Yeah. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Okay. Um, yes, of course. I mean, um, this this has to do about the, the the sort of like this um the mythical world of of certainty. Okay, mm -hmm. where um so the, the the three myths that I keep, or oh, you know, it's, it's not just mine. It's other people have been um, sharing this. Um, um, the three myths that we see in sort of like product development and so on is that first of all that the customer knows exactly what they want or they know what they want. Mm. Um. um in reality, the customer doesn't know what they want. They can give us an indication of what they want. They have an idea of what they want. Um, they might be better and worse at articulating what they want. Right. But they only, we only really know what we want when we actually have an interaction with our product. Interaction could be touching, seeing, smelling, tasting, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, I'll give the example of, you know, people going to a shopping cart, yeah, um, mm -hmm. like a retail store, and you see a, a shirt that you really like. You buy it, you wear it, and then you're like, oh, it doesn't really work. Let me send it back. <laughs> so, you know, um, we, only, we, we only discover the reality is not that we know it, but the customer does not know what they want. The reality is that customer discovers what they want, and it, re it requires that empirical exchange. So that's one. The second one is that then that the, the people that have to produce this product developers, you know, marketing, creatives, whatever it is. Um, the myth is that they know how to build it. Mm. And that's again, it's a myth. Um, usually the piece of the product which contains the real value is something that we haven't done before. We might have done something similar, but if we had done it before exactly like what we need now, we will be just downloading it to copy and pasting, or we will have a library. Right. Mm -hmm. it's something of value it usually means that we haven't done it before so it requires another creative process there it requires another cre uh, another discovery process so we don't know how we're going to do it until we actually do it we don't even know whether it's possible to do it until we do it. yeah um which brings into 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 play things like you know the way we want to estimate and the way we want to define you know the, the technical scopes and the architectures and things like that. We have an idea, an approximate idea of what we might be trying to do, but we don't know how to do it until we do it. Mm. That's number two. And then the last one is that we treat our work as the myth is that we treat our work as if nothing is going to change. Um, but reality is that by the nature of the other two, that there is a discovery process, what we should be doing really is expecting change and then harness that change. change. That change is usually learning, finding the things that we didn't pick up the first time, discovering better ways. You know, we talk about these days a lot about fit for purpose. Mm -hmm. So a real market or a real um, market fit, both for the customer and for the company, is usually something that we, we discover along the way. So... 
the myth is this certainty about customers know what they want. You know, we know how to build it and nothing is going to change. Reality is that we discover what we want. We discover how to build it along the way. And obviously, we expect to change and we should harness that. That's, it. <laughs> That's wonderful. It's great how, how these things, they're actually not, not exactly new, yeah. but they, they, they are in a way. <laughs> because even Henry Ford, he also said, it's a famous quote, but yeah. he also said, if I ask uh, the customers what they want, mm -hmm. they would tell me faster horses, if I ask the people. Mm -hmm. So he would never have reached the manufacturing of cars if you ask people what they want in that way, meaning... Yes, they, they understand the pain, but they don't really get the true solution. The interesting thing there as well in what you said is that many times um, what I see many, many of us doing is that we keep, um, how can I say, a lot of our training is, has, it leads us towards um, focusing on solutions, find solutions, find solutions, find solutions. What we need to be better at, and I think a lot, a lot of companies are better at this, is, is about like, before you find a solution, you need to understand the problem. Mm -hmm. so ask for the needs, ask for what the customers really need. And, and that's an interesting aspect of the, of the Henry Ford, Ford quote, quote, because, you know, faster horses was another solution, but it was not really discovering what the need was and, and the need mm -hmm. was, uh, you know, better distance from the, the transportation, or something like that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's just a very interesting aspect there as well. Mm, yeah. And... Are there any better questions we could ask instead of, oh, which methodology should they choose to achieve business agility? What should people really be focusing on? Um, it's a good question. I mean, I think, exactly going, going back to what I just said, you know, mm. suppose if we start a conversation about what methodology to choose, um, we are already in solution, to, in solution mode. Yeah. Right. Um, um, what's the problem? Well, we're trying to change. Why? Why do we need to change? You know, how does the world look better for you or for us? Yeah. So I think many times um, um, I use the, the example of um, Fight Club, the film. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the number one rule of Fight Club was don't talk about Fight Club. So <laughs> for many, many times, the number one rule of um, agile or a method is don't talk about it. Um, talk about how we are making. What do we need to do to make, make to make this company better? Or even better, does the company need to be better? And mm -hmm. if the answer is yes, then so okay, what does better look like? Based on based on that, then we can start saying we can start thinking about okay, how are we going to make that better? Yeah, but but many things we start we don't start we don't start with why we go straight into solution mode and we start talking about the hows and the whats. Right. So uh, I think it's really important that we 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 start thinking about you know. Why are we doing this? What's the motivation? What's the what's the what's the end game? What kind of like aspiration we have? What kind of goal? You know, what's the true north? Um, what does what does success look like for us? And then we start thinking about how we can get there. Mm -hmm. And is there any kind of um, example, or or maybe you've in your experience you've seen people trying to go through this process and they were thinking, okay, why are we doing this? Okay, how where do we want to get? Mm -hmm. And then there was something that really undermine the whole process. Maybe they chose their own goals or they focused on their own outcomes. Is there any example of what kind of things would really throw, throw the whole initiative down? Um, I think there could be countless examples of that. Um, the, the, the one thing for me in this is, I think looping back to the, to the beginning is we might have an idea of what better looks like, but Obviously, we have to keep our brain switched on and make sure that we regularly reflect and see how we're doing, whether those goals and aspirations are still valid, whether there are better ones, whether they, you know, things, things will change along the way, I'm sure. Um, so I think the things that will typically throw us back is lack of reflection, lack of adaptation. Um, um, uh, fixing our minds into this is exactly what we're going to do and there's not going to be any change. We know exactly what we need to achieve. Um, um, lack of engagement. If, if the organization is not doing um, the right thing in encouraging people, making sure people participate, we own the change together. Right. We are part of that change. I, I, you know, I think that, that creates problems if... If senior management, um, if it's one of these, like I always, um, I always make a, 
a bit of a trick question when we're doing talking about change, um, psychology of change, is that I usually ask people like, what's the most difficult thing to change in your organization? And I hear many times things like, or you know, I say, what or who is the most difficult thing to change in your organization? And I, you know, hear the usual, usual suspects, you know, senior management, the boss, me, the project manager, <laughs> um, or the, um, um, are we going today? Is the culture? Is the processes? Is procurement? Is it's always someone else. Yeah. Mm. And, and, and my, my take on this is like the most difficult thing to change in your organization is me, each one of us, because like, you know, as a joke, I say like, you know, I'm right. Every other Muppet is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but, but that's, that's true many times. We, we tend to be in this, you know, my, I hold my, to my ideas really strongly. Um, and we, we start saying it's everyone is everybody else um, kind of a responsibility to change or, you know, they need to change because, because I'm, I'm right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and we don't realize that in order to change and to do into things is, you know, it takes two to tango. Yeah. In how can I expect someone else to change if I am not prepared to do anything myself? How, how, you know, getting, getting things different around there also means that I have to be open to change myself. Um, and the other one is, you know, you want to be changed. You want change to happen. You want people to do different things. Um, you have to be the first one, exhibit it, exhibit, you know, be the change that you want other people to be. Now, if what we are exhibiting is that we don't change, then why should we, why should that our behavior somehow lead to other people then willing be willing to change? So it's, it's a lot of things about that. Mm, yeah. Well, thank you for summing it up. And uh, going back to the beginning mm -hmm. for the for the end. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we say that agility is no longer an option. Yeah. But what if today, as a business, I say, well, I I still think I'm right. Mm -hmm. I still think I know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. All of these experiments and other things, it's, it's definitely not what we can afford yeah. or not what we want to do. How would the future would look like for this business? What kind of consequences can they expect in short and long term? Um, the long term looks like, you know, an eulogy. You know, we will talk about the company in past times. We will be talking about the HMVs. We will be talking about the blockbusters, and, you know, and then the many, many, many companies that die every year. Um, uh, it was interesting for me. I mean, uh, um, I was doing this presentation uh, recently in, in one of the banks. And uh, one of the things that I did is like, um, when I thought it was not an option, I was kind of like, I feel kind of like nodding things and people saying, like, okay, no, we don't have to. But then uh, I put a few logos out there of all the new incumbents in banking, like, you know, all in the financial sector, like companies like TransferWise, companies like Monzo and N26 and, and so on. And these companies are allegedly very agile in the way they do. They're much smaller, really fast to deliver. They are experimenting. They are, you know, they, they, are, they are incrementally delivering services very quickly. They are really disrupting the banks. I think potentially in the, long, in, in the longer term, a lot of the banks that we know today will not exist anymore. Now that could be 10, 10, 20 years easily as well. Yeah. But if we want, if, if companies are like, like, you know, banks, for example, I, I think they want to survive. They, they seriously need to bring um, far more agility into their, into their thinking and practices and approaches. Mm, yeah. So I guess so it was very interesting the sort of like phases when, you know, when you put all these ones, I said, these banks, these other little banks now here, they are, they, are, they are to kill you and they will effectively kill you if you don't do anything. Sometimes you could say in the natural world, you know, um, survival is not really necessary. Um, some, some things are okay to die. You know, I, I was working a few years ago with one of the big banks and, and you know, some of the takes, we, one of the conversations we had at some point, um, and this might, might not be fair, but I was saying like, maybe the, the way to, to, to modernize a bank is actually to create a new bank. Hmm. Yeah. Um, now we could create, you know, if we are part of bank X, it could be, we creating the new bank that eventually kills us or replaces us, mm -hmm. or we let someone else build the bank instead of us. And then someone else kills us. Um, right. you know, th there are some organizations that may not be in a position to really change. Uh, and I'm using banking as an example. They are, you know, we, we've seen countless, I mean, the, the automotive environment the sector is yeah. changing, the fintech, insurance, mm -hmm. um, education, there are a lot of the, of the, of the industrial se sectors which are being um, disrupted little by little. Yeah. Yes. And that's coming back to the argument that people might make, oh, it, surely it's not for my industry, but obviously it's happening all over the place. And mm -hmm. if we're missing our chance, mm -hmm. we've missed it. Mm -hmm. So I guess that takes us to a future where agility becomes the default, things like that. Mm -hmm. if, um, 
even on this podcast, we've talked to some people who already made some great examples of specific brands and companies mm-hmm. that are disrupting their industries. Mm-hmm. Everyone talks about Spotify, mm-hmm. but I guess that's it then. The future is going to be agile no matter if you want it or not. Is that, how we, is that why we say agility is not really an option? <sighs> Yes, I mean, I think I think agility is not is is, is exactly that. Um, the, the one thing that I'm, I wouldn't say is that um, the answer is agile or agility as we know it today. Um, mm-hmm. What we also have to be prepared is to for us to for for our own understanding of what agile is or agility is to also evolve. Um, I I was a bit. To be honest, I was a bit slightly disappointed with um, the latest revision of the Agile Manifesto because mm-hmm. um, it was something like 15 years on or, or whatever it was. And, and I think they didn't even change a comma. Yeah. Uh, and that's interesting for me. We say that we are learning by doing it and helping others do it. But then there is a 15-year loop and we say, I oh, don't know, no, we got it right. So, uh, that, that doesn't sit easy with me. We've learned a lot, yeah? Um, and for example, the manifesto still talks about software development. Right. Yeah, we're talking about you know going way beyond software development and going into other 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 kind of activities, knowledge work um, activities in the business. So, um, what, will it be called agile? Will, will we call something else? I don't know. I actually don't know. But will, will it will it be evolving? You know, I, I wish I would be alive by the end of this century because you know, <laughs> um, sometimes the analogy that I say uh, it feels that in some ways we're still at, um, similar to the 1910s, 1920s, hundred years ago. And we are building clunky Model T cars. <laughs> I would like to be. I would like to see the you know the modern um, car factories equivalent in our field in knowledge work. You know, towards the end of this century, what will they be? How will we work? What kind of like things will we be doing? Uh, you know, it, it fascinates me. There are some really really interesting things happening out there, um, which indicate that you know there are. <laughs> we, we are getting to a point that I, I guess there is going to be some some really interesting. Um, discoveries coming together and things emerging, which, which is, is, is interesting. Um, we will see. Wow. So yeah. disruption is coming, whether we want it or not. Evolution. Modern disruption is just evolution. We, we are learning, we are becoming more mature. And I mean, uh, the way we manage companies is still anchoring when we, what we invented in the 1920s, 30s. Mm-hmm. We haven't really come up with the equivalent of um, scientific management, for example, that, that was created for the manufacturing world. What's the equivalent um, of scientific management for knowledge work? What is what the, the MBAs of the future will be teaching for knowledge work? They're still teaching something that it's not really adapted to today's world, at least, at least in knowledge work. Um, so, um, you know, it's interesting times. I think there is some extremely clever people out there doing really interesting things. <laughs> And I guess on this very inspirational and excited note, we'll have to finish here. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's really been a pleasure. Thank you so much for giving yeah. us um, more about agility and giving a different outlook on this whole topic. Yeah, no, thank you very much for having it. It's been really enjoyable. And, you know, um, it would be just interesting to see how people think, you know, people think about this. Um, it would be great to hear people's feedback, people, um, you know, own thoughts and experiences and just, just see where we go. Thank yeah. You. Awesome. Thanks a lot. Thank you. If you're watching us on YouTube, leave us a like. Thanks for joining us and see you here next time.